Good morning, everyone. I almost tempted to say Happy New Year's with the countdown. <laughs> good morning, good morning. If you are outside and you hear me, come on in, find your seat. Our kindly ushers will usher you where you need to be. couple verses for you before we get started this morning. This is Psalms 118, Passion Translation. Miss Rachel actually sent this to us last week and the team. It was just so good, I thought this would be a good time to read it. Starting in verse 19, Psalm 118, verse 19. It says, swing wide, you gates of righteousness, and let me pass through. And I will enter into God's presence to worship only Him. I have found the gateway to God, the pathway to His presence for all His devoted lovers. I will offer all my loving praise to you, and I thank you so much for answering my prayer and bringing me to salvation. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? We just take a moment to just unite together with his spirit with his heart this morning I know we come from different backgrounds this morning we come from different moments some happy peaceful some some not so peaceful chasing our families out the door so Holy Spirit we just take a moment to tune into you to quiet our hearts set our mind on you. Father, we lift our hands to you. We declare you are great. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of all our adoration. You are worthy of every word we can sing, of every clap we can clap. We choose. We choose to make a joyful noise to you. We choose to worship you with all of our heart. be held back by the way we feel or by anything else because you are worthy you are awesome God we love you can we give him some praise this morning church Hallelujah.
need to clap.
four years of my life where I couldn't sing this song and I would I would stand here and I would and tears would fall from my eyes like they are today and I would say God I am singing these words and I don't believe them but I don't believe that you're good and I forced myself to say them anyways and I believe there's probably some here this morning because of your situation or because of how you're feeling that it's hard for you to say that God is good this morning can I encourage you that we are not just people of flesh we are more than our circumstances. We are more than how our body feels. We are more than our health. We are more. These are just earthly things that are going to pass away. But we are a spirit man inside. And we need to say to that spirit man, rise up. God is good. He is good whether we feel it or whether we don't feel it. And it is a sacrifice of praise when we can stand here and say, God, I don't feel good but I know that your word says you are good. And so we need to stand in agreement with his word that says he is good all the time.
today. Worthy is your name. Hallelujah. Come on. You can give him more than that. You can give him more than that. He is worthy. He is worthy. Worthy. Worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb. Hallelujah. You can go ahead and be seated. We're going to do the announcements and right on the tail end of the announcements, we're going to do a short video clip, slideshow from our last week's youth retreat, youth outing, just because it's kind of a tradition, a lot of fun, a lot of good stuff happens there. And then right after that, um, Ron, Ron Duran is going to come up here and invite our guest speaker for the day. So go ahead and roll that. Hey everyone, welcome to Fusion and thanks for joining us today. We're really glad that you're here. Here's a few quick announcements. Last weekend we had the Fusion Youth Outing and the youth had a ton of fun. Here's some pictures and videos of what they got to do. The vlog has started. Youth Camp 2023.
on that one too. Thanks youth leaders for preparing a great weekend for the youth. Thanks to everyone who helped with the deep cleaning here at church yesterday. There was a lot to clean and you guys knocked it out quickly. 
We really appreciate you guys and what you've done. Thank you. The 2023 Kids Encounter with the Father is happening again August 17th through 19th. It's a weekend for children ages 9 through 12. The cost is $80 per person for the whole weekend, and it's going to take place at the Baptist Training Center in Camalote. You can sign up your child by contacting Susie Duick or Gabrielle Salazar. Those ages 6 through 18 are invited to two days of summer fun. This is hosted by the Brooklyn Tabernacle and Fusion, and will be starting tomorrow and ending Tuesday. It's going to be a sports camp and VBS with art, music, and dance workshops, and lunch is going to be provided. To sign up for this, be sure to call Ron and Edna at 628-8100. This Tuesday, we'll be having a ladies' meeting. It's starting at 6 p.m. here at Fusion with a light supper. Make sure you bring a finger food to share, and don't miss out. There's going to be a special guest speaker. Men are also welcome to come at 7 o'clock this Tuesday night for a fellowship with the men's group that's in town from the USA. Babysitting will be provided for the young children that come with their fathers. This Thursday at 7 o'clock, we're going to be having junior youth again. It's for those kids ages 10 through 12. If you have a child in that age range, make sure to bring them out this Thursday night for junior youth. This Friday is the Life Change Institute class graduation. It went by quickly so far and the students are going through their last week of classes. They'll each be sharing their testimony and you're invited to come listen and celebrate the good things that God has done with them. It's going to start at 7.30 p.m. this Friday night. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the service. so excited to be hosting a group, a team from our church in Brooklyn. And you know what the exciting part is? We have a, um, a church in Brooklyn and a church, a, a church home here. We are so blessed. But I'm going to ask um, the guys from Brooklyn if you could just stand up for a moment. They are the ones that's going to be uh, directing the activities of uh, coming up this week. I'll uh, be talking more about it at the end of the service. But right now I'd like um, to introduce uh, Pastor Jerry Park. Um, I've known Pastor Jerry for about 20 years and uh, close to it. Um, and there's a lot I could say, but I think I'll just summarize it by saying Pastor Jerry has a passion for God and a passion to see people come to know Jesus. Not just to know Jesus, but to develop um, a walk, a strong walk with Jesus. Um, and he does this around the world, and he goes to some of the most difficult uh, mission fields on the earth. Um, I don't know if that's what he's gonna talk about, any of that, but um, this I, I consider uh, Pastor Jerry, Edna and I both consider him uh, a trustworthy friend, and I'd just like to have him come up here now. Let's welcome Pastor Jerry Park. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Ron. It's uh, an honor and a blessing for me to be here with you. And Ron and Edna I've known for a very, very long time, it's true. And I remember they've both been on quite a few mission trips with me, both in uh, uh, this side of the world as well as in the other side, Africa, Asia, so many places. And then I had the privilege of marrying them. And even though I'm, I'm a little younger, I do feel kind of like uh, a spiritual parentage <laughs> over them. Uh, but they're such a special couple. And we do miss them in New York, but we're grateful that they're able to serve here in Belize. And I do send greetings from my senior pastor, Pastor Simula, and the Brooklyn Tabernacle Church back at home, as well as my wife and my three children. Uh, they send you their love and greetings. And my daughter actually had been to Belize a number of years ago when uh, I took another team here as well. So. I wanted to share this, this thought with you, and it is true. I've been traveling a lot, ministering a lot globally, and these days I've spent a lot of time now in the Middle East. 
And it's been a very difficult journey there for people who are coming out of war and refugee camps and, and so forth. But I've also spent quite a bit of time in Africa, Asia, and I, I see the same issue amongst everyone that we're ministering to. So whether they came out of a war situation, an impoverished situation, there's, there's this, this lack that I'm seeing globally. So here's a few things, a few things that we lack that could hold you back. And this is what's happening. It's holding people back. So is it a lack of education? Uh, places that we go, we see people who are 20, 25 years old, they're in the first grade. And, or they've never even had an education, or they're illiterate. And you could say that that's really been holding them back, and that is true. It's holding them back in certain ways. Or what about lack of jobs? So I was in Nepal and Sri Lanka and that part of the world just a few months ago, and some of the young people were saying, well, we lack jobs. So their number one goal in life is to get their education and then go to America or go to Australia, just go out, because there's no jobs. And I see that in all these other places as well. Then there's a lack of, of health, good health. So I organize a lot of medical clinics. Uh, Ron and Enna have been a part of some of these medical clinics that I've done in, in Africa, the Caribbean, South America, the Middle East, and so forth. And so we see a lot of people with lack of good health. And it does indeed hold people back. If they can't work, they can't move, they can't walk, uh, or if they have chronic illnesses and they're constantly not able to go to work or do anything, yes, that holds them back. But there's another lack, which it doesn't matter if you're coming from a war-torn situation or you're coming from a place like Belize, or you could be rich, you could be poor, you could be a refugee, you could be working on Wall Street but there's a common lack that all of us seem to share, including myself. This is a lack that I struggle with as well, and I want to share that journey with you and maybe it will be encouraging to you. It's a lack of forgiveness in our lives. Lack of forgiveness. So there's a lack of forgiveness for some, for many, between us and God, the vertical. So whenever I go into the Muslim world, um, many who don't know Christ, that's their number one spiritual lack, lack of forgiveness. But even for those who are believers, who come to faith, and I've met many, many, who come out of Islam and have now become believers, they struggle with a lack of forgiveness for people that have persecuted them, as an example. Um, so there are many, though, who just don't have the faith at all, and so they have this lack of forgiveness vertically. And then there's a lack of forgiveness horizontally between us and other people that we know. It could be family, it could be friends. But the thing that I've realized for a lot of people is that these are interconnected. The vertical and the horizontal, they're interconnected. So let me review the, the vertical. Again, I don't know what your backgrounds are. You may have grown up in church all your life. Uh, and for some of us, like I grew up in a church, I may have known this intellectually, but it has to be something that's personal. So, the basics. Sin separates us from a holy God. And that sin is like a debt that we incur, that we, we hold on to this debt. We can do good works. We can do all these things for people, for mankind, but that's never going to pay off your debt. At best, you're just paying the interest. You're never paying off the principal if I could put it that way. Uh, sometimes I put it this way. You could be a good person for 364 days of the year, but you killed somebody on the 365th day. So you can go before the judge and say, well, judge, I've been a really good person. I've given to the poor. I've, I've fed the hungry. So can't all those 364 days outweigh my one murder? No, the judge is going to say, no, you're going to be guilty for that one murder. So it is for us. You know, these good works, they, they'll never outweigh the sin that we have. 
And so Jesus is the one that pays the principle of your debt. So we can only pay the interest in our good works, which really amounts to nothing. Only Jesus pays the principle of our sins. And then when we receive forgiveness from Jesus, wipes away the debt clean. We're, we're debt free, right? That's the gospel. That's the good news. It's receiving Christ, his forgiveness, and our standing before God changes. We come from being an enemy of God, being estranged from God, to being his son or his daughter. That's the big difference. And that's what I did not understand growing up. I just thought you had to be a good person. I'm a Christian. I was born into a Christian home. Thus, I was a Christian. I didn't fully understand that part of the gospel, which is the heart of the gospel, right? So that's, that's the vertical, forgiveness between us and God. But then there's that horizontal, forgiveness between us and our fellow neighbor, our family member, our, another person. So you may think that that's not related. Like, I have this uh, forgiveness issue with my, my brother or my neighbor or someone, but it's okay, I'm saved. I'm, I'm good with God, so I'm good. I can just coast and go to heaven. But there are some scriptures that, uh, that you're gonna hit that you can't get past. So, for example, Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. And this is right after Jesus talks about what we call the Lord's Prayer. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Your father, you become a believer, you're in the family of God. Your father will not forgive your sins if you don't forgive others their sins. So forgiveness of other people, are, it's a major part of God's whole picture of forgiveness. So that's a problem for all of us, I would say. And I'm not a prophet, but I'll prophesy that whether it's today, maybe tomorrow, somebody is going to offend you. Now, if you're in New York, that happens as soon as you walk out of your house, as soon as you drive your car, as soon as you take the subway, someone is gonna offend you, I guarantee you. Now, maybe in Belize, maybe it takes a few weeks, I don't know, it seems so nice and country and peaceful here, but one thing I do know is that we all share, whether you're in Belize or America, is that we all have a sin problem. We all share that same issue. We are all sinful creatures. So when somebody offends you, there's three ways that we all can react. So the first way is revenge, to pay someone back wrong for wrong. So a long time ago, I remember watching a movie, and it was about the mafia, and maybe some of you may have watched it, but uh, it's, the guy says, look, if someone sends one of your people to the hospital, you send one of theirs to the morgue. Or if, if someone pulls a knife on you, you pull a gun on them. So in other words, if someone does something wrong, you pay them back triple, quadruple. And honestly, that's, that's also the Brooklyn way. <laughs> you know, the way I grew up, you, if you got beat, you got to beat them back 10 times. And, but then where does that end, you know? So you, you know, think about children. When you're a child or if you have children, um, you know, child gets into a fight. So then that child goes to get their big brother. Their big brother then beats him up. Then that kid then gets his brother, his father, his uncle, his, his best friend. They come and then they beat this family up. And then on and on and on. Wars. Country wars start this way. And I've been around too many war zones and I've seen this happen too much. It's like one clan against another clan that escalates to multiple clans and then other clans. And then guess what? You've got a major world war. So it, there's no end. You know, you, you may be satisfied in that moment getting revenge, but then it just it never ends and you're never going to be satisfied. In New York, this happens, on, unfortunately, too many times. We'll have, like, gangs who, who uh, get insulted by somebody else. And so they came, this was in the news uh, some time back, and they came with guns and they sh shot up this, this group, this family of this one person that offended them. And then 
a young three-year-old got shot and I think killed. You know, and then, then what are they going to do? They're going to want revenge back on them and so on and so forth. It's just, it just never ends. Uh, their revenge could take other forms as well. Maybe this is the more Christian form or the more sanitized form. But let's say someone offends you and maybe it's a family member. You know what? I'm never going to talk to them ever again in my life. I will never talk to them. And so you have family members who haven't spoken to each other in 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, generations. I will never forget what your father did or your grandfather did and your great-great-grandfather did. And it just passes on and on. It's like, it, again, it just never ends. You know, I think about, again, being in the Middle East, the, the Islamic militants, a lot of times when they talk, they talk about those crusaders. So to me, a crusade, I never talk about crusade. That's more in the westernized context. But they're talking about people from Europe that did the crusades almost a thousand years ago. Can you imagine that? They're holding on to this idea of revenge against the crusaders that happened almost a thousand years ago. So some of this can go generation to generation to generation. It, it's, it can be kind of crazy. But then if you think, well, that's not me. Well, again, think about the way you take revenge by, let's say, avoiding people, not talking to people that have offended you, avoiding them. And, you know, we're all guilty of this. I've done this uh, when I'm hurt, if you're hurt, or maybe I'm the only non sanctified person here, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure a lot of us have done something of that nature, right? So the second way we can react is we ignore the offense. We try to brush it aside and pretend it doesn't hurt us. But honestly, that almost never works either. In fact, I would contend it never works because we tend to remember these insults and even if we don't act on it immediately, we tend to like have our own database so I'm from a technology background, I've worked with databases, and you can have this little database that's growing, 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 and um, you may file it away and think it's hidden back there, but something can happen, all of a sudden, you whip out the database and you're like, hmm, all these record of wrongs are there, even if they're very, very small. So when you ignore it, and even if it's small, they're gonna start to add up, and at some point, we typically reach our limit, and then we explode. So this probably describes me a little bit more. I try not to be a hothead where I react and try to take revenge immediately, but I tend to think about it, process it, and then I, I feel insulted, and then you know maybe a week later I'm like, hmm. But I don't react in the moment, so I try to ignore it. But then little by little by little. So I was doing a marital counseling recently, and this one spouse, she said, I'm working on my, my anger issue, and so now if I say something uh, and my husband ignores, I'll say it three or four times. And then what happens on the third or fourth time, then she explodes. So I said, the problem isn't the number of times you're trying to ignore it. You've got to get back to the root of why does it offend you in the first place? But in her mind, she's thinking, well, I'm just going to keep ignoring it, ignoring it, and maybe something will happen that will change the other person. And I was like, you're not going to change the other person. You know, there's a definition about insanity, which I don't know if I totally agree with, but, you know, insanity is like trying the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. You're not changing the other person. The only one who has to change is you and your reaction to this offense. And the offense that we talked about was going to Starbucks and, you know, her husband was conscious of the budget and she didn't, he, he was conscious of not spending five or six dollars for coffee because of their budget. And so she would complain three or four times and then on the fourth time or so, she would just explode. Well, this is what I find most of the time, that that's what we good Christians do. We try to ignore it. We try to be super spiritual. No, Lord, that won't offend me. I won't let that offend me. Thank you, Jesus. But the reality is, most of us 
In fact, I tell my teams, all these teams that are gathered together, I've seen this happen too many times. If you feel offended, you've been offended, address it immediately. Don't try to whitewash it. Don't try to be the Apostle Paul. Don't try to be something you're not. Because ignoring it, you're just delaying the reaction later. So ignoring it is one of those reactions that you can take with offense. The third is the hardest thing to do. In fact, I would contend it's impossible to do in your natural self, and that's to forgive. To forgive. The problem with forgiveness is that it just seems so unjust. You know, how can we let someone get away with that? And, you know, I, I've struggled with that my entire life, and I'll, I'll share a story later about that, but it just seems so unjust. So let's address that. So number one, um, all of us will have to give an account to God. So Romans chapter 14, verse 12. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. So, you know, we may think they're getting away with it. No, don't worry about this. this. This doesn't last just to the time of your death. It goes after your death. God is the ultimate judge, and he will keep the accounts. Uh, so it's not like everyone is going to get away with it if they don't get away with it here, you know, or if they get away from, uh, with it here. So there will be an accounting with God. But number two is that forgiveness does come at a great cost. Someone has to pay for it. So, if someone offends you and they beg forgiveness and they try to make things right, then the offender, offender pays that price. And that's kind of like the ideal. That's like the break even. There's no profit or loss. Person offends you, but they ask for forgiveness, you forgive them, all right. I mean, there's still kind of a loss, but let's just say that's a break even situation. The problem comes to me when they don't ask for forgiveness. What if they don't ask for forgiveness? And that's probably the most common situation. So that means you're forever at a loss. If this is break even, you're at a loss and you're forever at a loss. Now, you just have to remember that something happened to Jesus on the cross where he said in Luke chapter 23, verse 34, Jesus said, forgive them Father, for they don't know what they are doing. The, the people who crucified Jesus, as I recall in the Gospels, they never came up to the cross and said, you know, Jesus, I'm so sorry we put you up there. Can you forgive us? No. No. They doubled it. They, they spat on him. They insulted him all the way up to the point of the cross, and they mocked him, as you recall. But Jesus forgave even though they didn't even come to him for forgiveness. So for me growing up, I forgave you if you asked for forgiveness. That's kind of like the fair way. That's the, the kind of, quote, normal way that we grow up with forgiveness. But that's not the biblical Jesus way. So forgiveness, instead of the, the cost being paid by the offender, it's being paid by the one who is offended. Right? But that seems unfair also. So, you know, you're, um, you're offended, now you're in a loss, and then that's like taking money out of your own pocket to repay what was stolen from you to get back to break even. That, that seems unfair as well. But this brings about the most freedom for you, for me, for the person. So the person no longer has that hatred and resentment waiting to take revenge or trying to pretend it doesn't hurt when it really does. And every time you remember the offense, you get hurt all over again, right? That's what happens to me. I don't know if it happens to you. And there may have just been one offense that had taken place, but our minds are like YouTube. You all watch YouTube, right? <laughs> Every time you think about that person, or maybe the person comes in front of you, what, what do we do? We go to YouTube and hit repeat. Ah, oh, that person did that to me again and again. And it's like, 
your debt goes, it doubles every single time. Now you're deeper and deeper in debt, even though the offense only happened once. You're going further and further into debt by hitting repeat on YouTube, re-watching, getting re-offended by that one thing that happened. True forgiveness allows that person to move on, it allows me to move on with our lives with a clear conscience. So you think about it in another way. So if someone steals your food from your, your home, let's say, do you stop eating until you wait for that person to come back and bring your food back? What are you doing? Let's say you don't have no idea who it even is. You don't stop eating. You have to survive. You have to eat, right? So you have to go and buy food so that you don't starve. But that's what happens to us spiritually. We think that by waiting for the other person to ask for forgiveness, and even worse, let's say they said, oh, I did nothing wrong. That's your problem. That's even worse, right? Then you get even more offended because they're not acknowledging the offense to you. But that's also pretty common, I find, as well. But you have to move on. Now, it's one thing if it's somebody, let's say, who is a family member or a friend. But even more difficult is if it's your enemy or someone who then becomes your enemy. So for myself, I grew up an extreme minority where I, in New York, and I faced a lot of racism, a lot of racism. We're the only, I'm from a Korean background, we're the only ones in this area. The, the other majority was 99.9%, .9 and we faced really, really tough things, just being spit on, having rocks thrown at us, my parents getting insulted left and right, my, my siblings. I grew up with a lot of hate, a lot of re revenge in my mind, but I, be, being this minority, I felt completely uh, constrained. If I tried to do something, guess what? The entire neighborhood came against me. So even if I wanted to take revenge, I wasn't even ignored, but I felt like I was powerless. So this, this hatred really started to build up in me until when I was about 16 or so, that's when I really understood the true gospel and I understood God's forgiveness through Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross and his love for me. And that was finally what broke this, this chain in my mind where all I kept thinking about was to take revenge on these childhood enemies that I had surrounding me. And the problem I had was a lot of them had left and they never asked for forgiveness. So after I got saved, I had to forgive them in my heart. So at first I thought, this is impossible. And I saw Jesus' example in Luke 23 at the cross, and that's the first time I said to myself, wait a minute, this is what Jesus did. I just realized these people never came back to him for forgiveness, but he forgave them. And I said, but that's Jesus, that's not me. I don't have that kind of power. Um, let me, let me, I'll go share the gospel, and I did. I would share the gospel with others, but then I, I was carrying this burden of, of hatred and revenge in my heart. I said, I can't do this. I can't do this. But the Lord used different examples, like uh, my, one of my heroes of the faith, his name is Richard Wormbrand. He uh, was a Jewish uh, non-believer, but he became a believer. And he grew up under the Nazi regime, uh, and then uh, some of his family and his wife's family were killed by, by Nazis. And then the communists came, and then he became a believer. And he was in jail and tortured for Christ. That's the name of his book, Tortured for Christ. And when I started to read that, for the very first time, I saw this man who was tortured for the faith, but who loved the people who were torturing him. And I said, I don't have that. I don't have that. I don't have the strength for that. But before I kept thinking, well, that's Jesus. He forgave on the cross, but that's not normal people like us. And then I saw this man who was tortured for Christ and for 15 years in a prison, and he was able to love the people who tortured him? I said, well, wait a minute. This, this man, he's a man. He's just like any of us. God, I need to do the impossible because this is impossible. I can't forgive these people that have done this to me years ago and they're no longer here. I can't even tell them 
how am I going to live? How am I going to do this? It was, it was holding me back. And I was carrying this lack of forgiveness. And even though I was trying to minister, it was holding me back in this huge part of my, my life and my ministry. I just couldn't go. I couldn't go there because it would bring up this, these terrible feelings. And I had to say, Lord, you have to help me. This is impossible. And slowly but surely, he did. He began to work in my heart. And little did I understand it at the time, but that would start to inform my own ministry. So having grown up under this, this racism and oppression and being uh, the, the outcast, so to speak, as I started to minister, as we started going overseas and as we started going into places like the Middle East, I was meeting these refugees. I was meeting people who were persecuted. I was meeting people who I'm like, I know how you feel. I know why you are doing the things you're doing, but I have to share something with you. So that forgiveness that God had to give to me supernaturally, which by the way, that is not to me a one moment thing. It's not like, oh, God gave me forgiveness, I'm done. Like I said, I'm in New York. I have to <laughs> I get these feelings of, Ugh, I, want, <laughs> I want revenge on the guy who just cut me off on, on the highway. I need God's forgiveness, the power to forgive every day, every moment. Otherwise, how, am I, how are you going to function? So it's not just this one-time thing. It's, like this, it's almost like a lifestyle of forgiveness, and it's impossible in our flesh. If we try to mentally say, I'm going to forgive, I'm going to forgive, I'm going to forgive. I forgive, I forgive, I forgive. That's not going to work. The Lord has to do something supernatural in your heart in order to forgive, and then he could do something incredible with it. So... Going back to this, like this feeling of, I, I understand how it feels. You know, my, my, my feeling of, of being uh, under the gun or, or, or oppressed and all these things. I, let me help people who I think are like that. And I think I did it subconsciously. So as we've been ministering to refugees who have fled Islamic militant, they, they, there were people that I felt a deeper compassion, a deeper understanding. And it's not just in the Middle East, everywhere, in Africa and Asia, Central, South America, everywhere I've gone. I, I, whenever people have talked to this, this, this feeling of wanting revenge or being oppressed and so forth, I felt doubly like I understand you. I had more empathy. I had more compassion. So I could have read about these things in a book, in some great theological manual, and I did. But the problem was that was all in here. It's going through, and having gone through all the garbage of my life and when I was young, that became this experiential power, this force or, or something that God used that the enemy meant for evil to tear me down, to bring me down. He turned it around, that same dark stuff that happened in my life, and he turned it and redirected it to something for good. And that's what God can do in all of our lives. These dark areas, these dark things that happen to us, these people you, you were hurt by tremendously or offended by, God has the power to redeem it and to turn something that the enemy meant for evil and turn it into a force for good. So just like this last year, if I think about it, not that I'm anything, but we started these uh, life centers. I call them life centers in the Middle East. They provide medical care, they provide education, computers, English, and so forth. And just in the medical care portion alone, in, in Lebanon, in Jordan, uh, in Pakistan, some of the hardest places to do any kind of Christian ministry, we've seen 23,000 people that have come through our clinics. And to me, that's a touch point of Christ. You can't share openly. We can't do meetings like this and, and an evangelistic meeting so easily. But we use the clinics as this point of outreach to to touch people with the love of Jesus and so that they would be open to hearing the words of Jesus. And if it wasn't through my own pain, like I would have said, you know, ideally, I wish I didn't go through this pain. God, why, why did I have to go through this suffering? Why did I have to go through that trouble? And at the time, it was extremely hard. But later, and that's the thing about God, God has that big picture for all of us. The suffering, the pain, the anger, the feelings of revenge, the offense that you've gone through. 
ideally for me, I would always say, Lord, why did we even have to go through this? Why, why couldn't, you know, I know you did this miracle later, but why did we have to go through this in the first place? It's like that the journey is what prepares you to minister to others. With the same pain that you went through, God brings this comfort and can redirect and redeem things. He's going to use you to do that for others and then for them, for others, and, and so on and so forth. You know, Richard Wormbrand, when he went through that period where he was in jail and being tortured, I can guarantee you he wasn't thinking, you know, there's going to be this guy from Brooklyn who's going to be inspired by this story, so I'm going to, I'm going to tough through it. No, he was going through it, and he could care less about that, but he needed God's grace, God's power to forgive and then everything else could flow from that. So for us, you know, I'll give you one more example, but for us, I, I'm, I'm, I guarantee you, I'm, I'm, I'm sure of this, some of us are struggling with some kind of unforgiveness. I'll give you one more example that inspired me way back when I first started ministry. There's uh, this family, the husband and wife, their name was Graham and Gladys Staines. And there were Christian ministry workers serving in India. Uh, my parents actually served in India for many years, and then I've served in India, and I've had a lot of Indian co-workers when I was working way back in the day when I was working on Wall Street. But they cared for lepers that lived in poverty for more than 30 years. They had a daughter, Esther, and two sons, Philip and Timothy. India, most of you may or may not know, it's, it's a predominantly Hindu country, by 85% Hindu but only 3% or so Christian. And anti-Christianity is very strong there. It's actually gotten much worse in the last 10 years. But in uh, 1999, Graham and his sons, they attended a Christian meeting with other Indian believers. And at night, there's no place to stay, so they slept in their car. But as they slept in their car, a mob of 50 Hindu militants, they trapped them in their car, and they, they forcibly kept the, the doors closed, and they burned them to death. They burned them to death. Two little boys and their father burned to death. The mob wanted to intimidate all these Christians because they were holding these meetings, and they decided to make Graham and his family an example, a warning. And frankly, I see th this kind of in the Middle East and other places as well where anti-Christianity is very strong. But this is one of those stories, along with uh, Richard Wormbrand, that began to have to make this shift in my mind and my heart. Despite this loss, the widow, great Gladys, stands. She publicly forgave the murderers. She said to all of India, and she, her story was broadcast publicly, and it was on the news, the video, everything. I am not bitter or angry. I have one great desire that each citizen of this country should establish a personal relationship with Jesus Christ who gave his life for their sins. The daughter, and having three girls myself, Esther, 13 years old, she said, I praise the Lord that he found my father worthy to die for him. I'm like, that's a 13 year old who understood the power of forgiveness and I I couldn't get it. But these were examples to me that said, it is possible. With men, it's impossible. With myself, it's impossible. I want revenge. That's the natural way of life. But with God, all things are possible. There's nothing impossible for him. So that's now my challenge, my question for you. So number one, is your vertical forgiveness problem solved? Coming to Christ, having your sins forgiven by him. That's the most critical part. But it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. I had to learn that lesson, as I said before. That's just the first step. Then the second step is forgiveness between us and other people. So you may have offended some people, and this takes some humility. Uh, and I've had to tell some of my teams this, like, uh, you have to have the humility to even admit that you are offended, if that makes sense. Because some of us, again, we, 
Some of us who are deep in ministry, we may think we're, we're super Christians. We don't get offended. No, we follow Jesus, uh, and I'm not going to let that offend me. But 99.9999% of the time, if you feel offended, I, you've been offended. Admit it. Just humble yourself. And I'm talking to myself. I've had to realize uh, I, that really did offend me. I have to go back, and that's... that's Matthew chapter 18, if, if you've been offended by someone, go to that person in private and make it right. And if it doesn't work, bring uh, two or three witnesses. You know that scripture. Um, if you don't, you should read it, Matthew chapter 18, because it's a very important part of forgiveness as well, make it, making it right. And then the third, which is the one I think I'm going to concentrate more here, and then we're going to pray, is are you holding resentment against someone? that you need to forgive? Is there someone in your life, and you could be a pastor, as I said to you before, I've struggled with forgiveness all the time. I dealt with some of my major things, but I find that almost every week, uh, somebody does something that offends me. So I need two things happening, and you do too. First of all, Lord, why does that offend me? In fact, that couple that I was talking about earlier, I had to go back and say, why does that offend you? We're talking about a cup of coffee. There's something deeper than a cup of coffee that's offending you. Let's deal deeper. Let's go a little deeper. Uh, and then we did. And there were other things that were much, much deeper with their relationship. Right? So, God, why is this even offending me? But help me now to forgive this person. Help me to forgive because it's impossible in my own power to forgive. I need the supernatural. Forgiveness to me is absolutely supernatural. And we need the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit to come. We think we need the power of the Holy Spirit to minister, to, to sing, or to, to preach, or to work with the youth or the kids, and we do. But I would also contend we need that same power to forgive those who've hurt you whether it's in the past, maybe you had an abusive relationship, abusive parent situation, or it could just be someone in the church that has offended you, you know, because of the way they greeted you, didn't greet you. I remember just recently, um, somebody came up to me and said, uh, you know, I've, uh, I, I feel like you, you, you hate me. I was like, what? what? Oh, because of the way you greet me or don't greet me or you ignore me. I'm like, my sister, I, I don't hate you at all. But, and this is, this is the funny thing, right, with all of us. We sometimes perceive other people the way they do or don't do things in a way that can, we can get offended. But the other person has no, no idea. So I had to tell her, I, I had no, no concept of being offended or hurt by you at all. But the couple times that I remember, I was in the middle of trying to, to do this and do that, and so I was a bit focused and distracted. But for her, she took such offense to it that I had no idea. So what I have also encountered is this. It, it's not good to say, well, I'm not going to ask for forgiveness. You took it wrong. The point is the other person took offense. They were offended. You may not have understood that or realized it or intended it. So what I say, and I, I try to always practice, is apologize. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Those are like the hardest words in the English language for some. I'm sorry. I apologize. Then you can bring understanding. When I said this or I did this, I meant this, I did, meant that, I didn't mean this, you know, you misunderstood, but I've offended you. I apologize. I'm sorry. But here is what actually took place. Most people bypass the forgiveness part. And they just said, well, I didn't, I didn't mean it that way. So you, you, that's your problem. That's your, your issue, right? I mean, is that just in Brooklyn? Or does that happen here? <laughs> right? That's just human nature. So I find you, when you offend somebody, they've been offended. Apologize. Then bring understanding. God has to give us that power, though, to even say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If I've offended anyone here, during any time that I've been here. I, I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> but, but seriously, 
Let's pray. And I'm going to ask, how many of you, you, you are struggling with a forgiveness issue? How many of you, if you want to raise your hands, how many of you are struggling with something or some situation that you have not forgiven? You're really struggling with it. If you can raise your hand. Okay, let's do this. If we could bow our heads, we're going to pray. But those of you who, who really need God's help to forgive someone, some situation, if you can come forward to the front here, and, then, and you could be a pastor, you could be a leader. Uh, before God, we're all, we're all human. We all struggle with the same things. But we're going to pray for God to help you to forgive to help you to forgive that person, whether it happened today, last week, 10 years ago. If you've raised your hand, or you didn't even raise your hand, but you feel like, you know what, I need to deal with this now. I need God's power to forgive now. I want you to come forward, and we're going to pray together, and we're going to ask God for the impossible, and even more, to forgive even our enemies. So those of you who raise your hands, why don't you come forward and we're going to pray. Again, it's, it can be a humbling thing, but it's going to be a freedom thing. You're going to be free of this. In the name of Jesus, you are going to be free of unforgiveness. Whatever somebody's done to you, you've been hitting repeat on YouTube that video of the offense well we're going to cut the internet now we're going to cut that stream now and say Jesus you're going to help me to forgive throw this thing into the sea of forgetfulness I'm not going to be bound by this I'm going to be free of this unforgiveness I'm going to be free of what that person did or didn't do of what my father did or didn't do, my mother, my brother, my sister, my son, my daughter, my spiritual son, my spiritual father, what they did or didn't do. Jesus, you're going to set me free today. It ends now. It ends today. And you're going to walk out of here free in the name of Jesus. So while I pray, those of you who are in the front, and even if you're in the back and you, you have a situation, a person, pray right now. Pray in your own words. Lord, help me to forgive this person. Help me to forgive my father. Help me to forgive my mom, my uncle, the abuse, the insult the snub, what this other person, even if it's in your family or in the church, use your own words, your own, your own lips, or even your, just in your heart, and let the Lord do something supernatural and free you. Father, you see those who come up here and we're just frail human beings it doesn't matter if we have a title if we have a pastor in front of our name or an elder or deacon or if we're an usher we just came this is our first meeting we're just human beings we're just flesh we, we all struggle at times but Lord, now we're giving you that person, that offense. And we've been struggling with forgiveness, maybe for years and decades even. But Lord, today, let it end now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I forgive that person. I forgive him. I forgive her. All the terrible things. Lord, I'm giving it to you. I'm laying it at this altar. And like a sacrifice, Lord, like a burnt
burnt offering, let it be burnt completely so that it is gone. It will no longer hinder our walk with you, our walk with each other. Lord, we want to be free of the supernatural chain that's bound us. So we need supernatural power to break it. By your Holy Spirit, Lord, break any chain of unforgiveness. Help us, Lord, to do the impossible. And we place that person, that offense, lay it at this altar in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I forgive. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We may not feel it, but it's done. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, thank you, Pastor Jerry. Um, yeah, I was going to uh, talk about just some details for the two-day event that's going to be occurring here at Fusion. Um, when you bring uh, your children, um, especially the younger ones, uh, a, a lot of people have already signed up, and that's good. We have contact information, but if you haven't signed up and you're, you, you're going to be dropping a child off, uh, we're going to have a desk set up somewhere, I guess, underneath the overhang, I believe. Um, if you would please uh, sign up and leave your contact information, um, that way um, we can handle what, what happens with your children responsibly in case something happens or you forget about them and you forget <laughs> that you lost track of time and we need to call you or, or whatever it might be, um, if, if you would do that. Um, also, um, I'd like to say on Wednesday afternoon at 6 o'clock, we're going to do a, um, a character and leadership um, conference. Uh, the person who puts the, puts the videos together, we, we, we did this, I believe it was in May or June. No, no, it, it had to be April. Um, uh, he, he's here, and he's part of the group that, that came down, and he's going to do this personally. We're going to talk about things like integrity, forgiveness, and... I know there was a third thing, but I can't think of it. And um, and I guess I guess that's it. And um, um, also, I guess I'm going to invite all of you guys up to New York <laughs> and enjoy the atmosphere up there. Uh, okay, so yeah, everybody have a, have a great day. Uh, thank you. Oh, that Wednesday event is going to be at the Unitedville Learning Center. It, huh? Not not at Fusion. Yeah, Wednesday night. <laughs>